The following conversation may not be appropriate for younger listeners or those who've experienced abandonment, sexual abuse, or drug addiction. The Lonely Beginning, Victoria, B.C. My mom left when I was two. While I was in her belly and my dad was standing on his head to find a poem, she'd met a sculptor, Paul. After I came out of her belly, she fell in love with him and didn't want me anymore. All I remember is crawling up on the couch, choking on tears, pressing my face and hands to the window, the glass getting cloudy from my breath as I watched her disappear. Disinformation is spreading. There will be a surprise outbreak. Is the issue of pandemic no social distancing at all? They They said that they would express their concerns um, about the mask supply. Where's the mask? Where's the gloves? A second wave is We all need some good news. A message for all the healthcare workers out there. Thank you. From Santa Rosa, California, this is 19 Stories. I'm Cheryl Holling. Today's guest, author Hannah Sward, has quite the story to tell. So much so, she wrote about it in her memoir, Strip, an International Book Award finalist, Reader's Choice Award finalist, and Book Soup bestseller, which is quite the homage to her late father, the renowned poet and novelist Robert Sward. Widely published in literary journals in the U.S., Canada, and the U.K., Her work has also appeared in publications such as the L.A. Times, HuffPost, and many others. She was a regular contributor at The Fix and Erotic Review and columnist and editor at the Third Street Villager in Los Angeles. Hannah Sward was born in the Bohemian 70s, abandoned by her mother at the age of two, and lived with her father on an island in Victoria, British Columbia, that had no stores or cars. At the age of six, she was kidnapped and molested by a stranger and as she got older, became a stripper and prostitute with a taste for crystal meth. Although Strip is often referred to as an addiction memoir, as one book reviewer wrote, this is just one part of it. Strip is about so much more. It is also a book about loss, loneliness, and the yearning for something more. It is also, as Nobel Prize winner J.M. Coetzee wrote, touchingly honest and written with a light touch. She writes about the silent gurus, sugar daddies, and drinking in the CVS bathroom before therapy sessions in a painstakingly honest, detailed, and often humorous way. Strip is a heartfelt memoir revealing Hannah's journey from innocence to darkness and beyond to a world of empowerment. It's that story, that message, and the ultimate redemption of her life and talent that we'll be talking about today. Hannah Sward, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to 19 Stories. Thank you, Cheryl. Such an honor uh, to be on. Thank you. You are so welcome, and I thank you for joining me today. How are you in Los Angeles doing? Well, it's a beautiful morning, beautiful Saturday, rainy morning here. Oh, it is raining there too. Yeah, because it's raining here as well. Love it. It's cozy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. How was your morning? <laughs> yeah, it's good. I did another recording prior to this, and I, as I said to that guest, I'm so happy we were not experiencing the deluge that we had in the middle of the night last mm-hmm. night, so that we could be here without the interruption. And I'm originally from Los Angeles, and while reading your incredible memoir and your very detailed descriptions of all the places you would drive to, visit, <laughs> or work at, it made me a bit homesick. So (laughs) it's definitely a character in the book. Yeah. And it also brought to mind, I don't know if you're familiar with the Saturday Night Live skit, The Californians. No, but I'll have to look it up. Oh, you have to look it up because the characters all describe a direction that they took. Like, oh, I was driving on the 405 and got off at the Hollywood Bowl exit, which of course doesn't exist. You can't get to Hollywood Bowl from the 405. And But in your case, you were so meticulous in your descriptions that I felt like I was in the car with you especially if you're reading about your frozen yogurt diet and your twice daily visits to penguins or the big chill. Yes. I had such a craving <laughs> for frozen yogurt, which I haven't had in ages. So, Oh my God. I haven't either. I never thought that I would not have to drive, uh, you know, 20 miles for a flavor. 
<laughs> and that is no small feat. Anybody no. who knows no. Los Angeles knows that you don't decide to drive 20 miles unless you really, really want to. Exactly. A, a true, I don't even know what the word would be. A true passion for, One word. for, but it goes along with what was going on in your life. And so, you know, I, I want to say, first of all, Hannah, how brave I think you are as you not only share such incredibly raw and real details about your life, but also about your family members as well. And I imagine that wasn't without a cost, as we tend to remember our family roles differently than our family members do, yes. simply because we live them. So your memories, I sense, are told through the lens, obviously told through the lens of your truth and not how others see them. Has this been a difficult read for the family and friends you wrote about? Thank you for that. Uh, definitely. My biggest fear was my father reading it. He read the first and last chapters. He did not read anything else. He wanted to along the way, especially since he's a writer and we, we have, you know, work collaborated before or at least shared each other's, you know, one another's work. Uh, it was a hard no from me that he would be able to. And, and he did pass uh, months before the book came out. And my mother, she was... Uh, my very biggest fear. And before the book came out, we talked about it, or I said, I, you know, I sat down with her. I said, mom, I'm very apprehensive about the book coming out and you reading it. My intention is and is and was in no way to hurt you. It's my story. And she, at that moment, seemed, you know, it's one thing to say it and another one to read it. Yeah. But, uh, she, you know, as an example of her lightness about it was, I remember one time writing a story about, uh, and it's in the in the book, a variation of it called My Mother's Men. And she knew that I I had posted it and I forgot to block her on Facebook from the post. Oh, okay. And, <laughs> and uh, she called and she said, oh, I want to read that. And I went, oh, it's not published yet, mom. You know, it's, and or it's not whatever, I forget what I said. And I hung up and then I called her back. I said, mom, I lied. It is, you obviously know it is. And I'm just scared to hurt your feelings with it uh, about you and your men. And she said, Hannah, it would take seven books to write all my men. It's okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah, that, however, was very difficult with Strip and it did not go well. So much so that it came to the point six months in where I let her know. I wasn't willing to talk about it anymore. I wanted to move forward. You know, when we think of memoirs, we tend not to think, you know, these are real people that people are writing about. Mm -hmm. And yet your story is your story, as I, as I mentioned, and, and why I think you're so brave. Because first of all, I am sorry for the loss of your father. I did read that he passed. And Thank you. what a legacy he leaves. I mean, that's Thank a, you. this man is incredible. And and just reading about some of the places, like I say, you're so detailed and talking about places within Canada. But when I read up on him, I wasn't, I got to say, I wasn't familiar with his influence, like mm -hmm. deep, deep influence within Canadian media and publications, et cetera. So, but Cheryl, with your- thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And with your mom, I mean, I know- Spoiler alert, you have a good relationship with her now, mm -hmm. and yet to write so raw and truthfully about your experience with her, I, again, I would imagine that wasn't easy. And what I like to share with my listeners when I introduce a guest is getting to know a bit about their story of origin. Yeah. And however, in the very first chapter of Strip entitled The Lonely Beginning, you tell of just that. A childhood that began with being abandoned by your mother at age two. And again, now understanding that you're very close to her. I didn't prepare you for this, but would you mind reading the first paragraph of that chapter for us? If Absolutely. You have the Lonely Beginning, Victoria, B.C. My mom left when I was two. While I was in her belly and my dad was standing on his head to find a poem, She'd met a sculptor, Paul. After I came out of her belly, she fell in love with him and didn't want me anymore. All I remember is crawling up on the couch, choking on tears, pressing my face and hands to the window, the glass getting cloudy from my breath, 
as I watched her disappear. She didn't see me at the window, but maybe if she had, she would have come back, but she didn't. It's a good thing my dad wanted me. I love him a lot. My mom had another baby, so I have a half-sister, Rilke, but she feels whole to me. She looks just like Paul, her dad, and everyone says I look like my dad, too. I wish I looked like my mom because she is beautiful, but she is moving away with Paul and Rilke to Florida where there are alligators. There's a going away party outside. Flowered skirts, bare feet. Rilke stepped on broken glass with that little foot of hers. There's too much blood. I put my daisy chain on her ankle. I don't want to tell her I'm not going with her. Thank you for reading that, Hannah. I, I got to say that when I read that, my heart just leapt for you. And I wanted to run after your mother and say, no, don't leave your sweet child. And then I began reading your chapter, The Man in the Brown Car. Mm-hmm. And my heart Wow. I I thought after reading the first chapter to go into that, it's a a very short chapter, but one where you describe your kidnapping and molestation. And while writing your memoir, I'm curious if you looked back on, you know, as you were writing it, as the moment you began disassociating from your Mm. feelings and what you wanted and the love you craved. Mm. I don't remember disassociating so much so that when I started therapy, uh, I remember the therapist saying, where are you? Mm. I was so disconnected from uh, myself, from what she was saying, I did not understand. And I really didn't like that question. And It wasn't until quite a long time later that I understood, not only understood intellectually, but felt it in my body when I would leave the room or leave myself. And that took a lot of work. And uh, so I I definitely was not aware of that as a child, leaving leaving myself or as an adult. It's interesting when we're talking about a book Mm -hmm. or a memoir, We certainly want people to encourage people to read it and give them a flavor of what you wrote about. But there's some very profound things you wrote about after that experience with the man in the brown car that led me to believe that maybe that was the time Mm. that that happened for you. And in your chapter, Waiting, you mentioned Mm. that your mom, I mean, you come from some really impressive stock. I mean, the the powerful, powerful women in your family that your mom was the only female in her graduating class in architecture school, that your aunt, great grandmother, your grandmother were all lawyers. And that in high school, you have good enough grades to join the Girls Honor Society. (laughs) Yes. I mean, hello. And by this time, you were in touch with your mom and had established a relationship But on page 63, in the third paragraph, you write something very poignant that describes a longing that you had for both of your parents. And Mm. if you wouldn't mind sharing that as well, I think that's an important paragraph right Mm. there. Yeah. Okay. This is a very interesting paragraph that you chose for me to read. I wrote this 20 years before the book was published. (gasps) Oh, wow. I did not know, of course, that it would end up in uh, the book. And it was from my first printed story that I ever published, Canadian uh, publication. I will read it now. My whole life was nothing more than a kind of waiting, waiting for my mom to come home, even though she never did. She'd sent me a package when I was five and I'd waited for more. I waited for her letters where she would describe her world in detail, especially the different men in her life. I also waited for my dad when he went to India to hang out with a swami or the writer's colonies in upstate New York and New Hampshire. Then there was the time he went to live alone in an art colony in New Mexico. Then Alina left and I watched him wait for her to come home and I waited for him to stop waiting. 
I waited for this terrible longing in me to go away, and I knew no one was coming back to fix it. My grant was running out. I became a regular at the gyro stands, went to matinee movies and walked the streets for some more. I looked at women dressed like Audrey Hepburn who sat at the cafes drinking coffee. And I looked at people who passed in the streets who seemed like they knew exactly where they were going and who they were. Thank you, Hannah, for reading that. You know, so much of what I felt in reading your memoir is this duality of abandonment and yet hope Mm. in your pursuits. First, the abandonment from your mom, then of feeling the abandonment at times with your father, and also from yourself in in manifesting in your addictions, the men you chose to be with, the work you did, et cetera. Would you say that your recovery began when you decided to love and embrace young Hannah that was abandoned and molested? Yes, absolutely. And that, as I would imagine anyone would imagine, and took a very long time, very long time. And I wasn't able to even begin doing that work until I got sober. And let's talk about that. Let's talk about crystal meth for a moment Mm -hmm. and how that came to initially be your drug of choice. Because regular methamphetamine powder, which is available in pill form, is a man-made stimulant that's been around for actually a long time and was used in World War II to help soldiers stay awake. And people have also used that drug to lose weight, ease depression, and manage ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And today, the only legal meth product is a prescription pill. Rarely is it used to treat obesity and ADHD. But crystal meth, on the other hand, Mm -hmm. is a strong and highly addictive drug. Not that I need to tell you that, (laughs) just more of an education for our listeners. And and that it affects the central nervous system and there is no legal use for it. And I know you initially tried crystal meth to lose weight, but beyond that, what did it provide for you that other drugs or alcohol initially didn't? Hmm. Oh, what did it provide? I want to say an escape from myself, but it really didn't. It, what it provided was it fed the abandonment for myself, the self-abandonment over and over and over again, the the self-hatred, the actions that I took that fed all of those feelings that I felt as a little girl, it confirmed it. Now, I would imagine other drugs might have done the same as it was crystal meth was what, or what I sought out in my path as you shared, initially to lose weight. I don't know why it took the way it did. I remember the very first time I did it, I was all in, uh, starting with the ritual of it. And, um, you know, I didn't go back to it again for quite a number of years, fortunately, or not fortunately that I went back to it, but that there was the period where I wasn't doing it. Uh, It planted something in me. Now, the one thing that we haven't talked about is what your motivation was to lose weight and also why your book is titled Strip. So at the time, I was stripping with my sister. She's a central character in the book, our relationship. When we were stripping together, we at one point realized the other girls weren't weren't trading clothes with us. And we were really insulted, as odd as that sounds. <laughs> And when I say clothes, I just mean strip, you know, the stripping clothes, which isn't much. Is that something that is just commonly understood that you you do share clothes <laughs> or lack thereof, as you said? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. No. Uh, and, and yeah. So I'm not even sure where that came from. And we, of course, were driving all around town for our yogurt, which is essentially uh, ice cream and we we're eating pints of it every day. So we got a little curvier and we thought <laughs> ice cream tends to do that. Ice cream tends to do that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we thought, well, maybe we should lose weight. And we tried different diets and uh, 
we asked girls at the you know strip club what they did and you know at this point my sister was 21 i was 24 i had tried cocaine once before that so by the time i was 24 i really wasn't you know i hadn't i mean drinking and you know i i really hadn't done anything and um, they said crystal meth and so we did that for a month together to lose weight very strangely neither of us did which is unheard of and so we moved on to something else when I read about that, I was like, I think maybe that's the only time I've read of someone doing crystal meth who didn't lose weight. But the, <laughs> it, it could have had something to do with your twice daily visits to the Big Chill and Penguins. I'm, I'm just saying. It may have. Thus the name Strip. And one of the things that I touched on earlier at the opening about writing about family and friends that you mentioned, but also from your stripping work that you then went into prostitution and you never mentioned names, mm -hmm. but you give really clear descriptions of some of these men, even one that had, after you had been with him, you then turned on the television to see him accepting an Academy Award. Yeah. And I'm wondering, has that come full circle or in, in a way come back to you? No. Um, no. Okay. No. No, not at all. I think I was vague enough. Uh, well, very vague. No. Not yeah, yet, you were. Anyway. Not, not yet, anyway. Well, in a way, I guess if you had, they'd be outing themselves, so it wouldn't make sense. That's true. <laughs> it wouldn't make sense. So That is very true. Yeah. But initially, I mean, eventually, you did stop crystal meth and you started drinking, which was never something that you had an affinity for. So no. what what happened that you said, okay, enough, I, I, I can't do that, which by the way, after reading how long you did it, I mm. am just in awe that you are in one piece now. I am too. <laughs> really in awe because you do describe how it affects you that from snorting it, going down your throat, all the things that go along with that. And I'm just thinking physiologically from being able to speak as clearly as you can, everything being intact. Yeah. It's, um, I'm very, very fortunate. Yeah. And so why drinking? What turned you to drinking and from meth to alcohol? So as you said, I would, had never been a drinker. And I don't even know how, I mean, it was something bigger than myself that had me stop meth. I don't know. I cannot even say what that was, uh, a miracle. And uh, at that point, I was uh, 36. And I, when I stopped that very soon after I started drinking wine, and I'd have a glass uh, my friends would be like, wow, this is really, you know, I'm, this is amazing. Cause I never drank with them. I just, I couldn't even finish a glass of wine. And, uh, what happened is that glass so quickly turned into three, turned into four and it terrified me. It absolutely terrified me because here I was at 36, never having been a drinker. And I was drinking and it just chilled me to the bone because I knew I was on the same path as with crystal meth. I knew one had replaced the other. So that was very clear to me that they were one and the same thing. The manifestation of it looked differently, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how I acted, but I was ingesting one substance, you know, substituting one for the other. And what's so interesting is you talk about going to therapy mm -hmm. and how when you were doing meth, the therapist you were seeing at the time never recognized it or called you out on it, which I'm not sure how that's possible. Yeah, I don't. But when you were drinking, you would drink before you would go into your therapy session mm -hmm. and you had a therapist that either it was in tuned or, and I'm not going to diss your former therapist, but when I read that this woman called you out, I'm like, this woman's paying attention yeah. and she's invested and she wants to see this woman get healthy. So you credit that therapist as really helping you get to the 
apex where you had to make a choice. Are you going to get healthy? Yes. And she referred you to the Friendly House, the first all-girls residential rehab that was established in 1951 as a person in place where you got sober. And what I didn't read is mm -hmm. whether or not AA played a part in your sobriety and if it's a part of your life now. Absolutely. It is. And it just for me, although I've loved reading other books where people are very clear that it was a 12 step program that helped them, it just that just didn't land with me. I wanted mm -hmm. to make it, um, I just wanted to talk about the community, perhaps too, because there are so many different communities for people to, to join, right? An answer to straightforward, yes, absolutely. It saved my life. Life It's given me a life. I'm as active in 12-step uh, as I was, if not more, almost 14 years ago now. Wonderful. Because I've listened to a couple of your podcast interviews, and yeah. you did mention that you were going to AA, but for those who read the book who may not have this information. I wanted to share that, how important a, a part that is for you. And having been to a few AA meetings with my late dad, I know that mm. donuts, he was he was an alcoholic. I know that donuts, candy and cookies, et cetera, are in abundance at most meetings. <laughs> they are. I mean, it, you talked about replacement, that alcohol replaced your meth. And it's as though the sugar in alcohol has been replaced by the sugar in all the forms you find it yeah. at meetings. And in your interview with author Amy Dresner, you mentioned that you don't have sugar in your home, nor would you cat sit for a friend who had it in theirs. And I'm curious about why the aversion to sugar. Wow, I don't remember. I don't remember that interview or that Q and A. So that's funny that you remember that with with Amy. Uh, my aversion to it is I can't control myself. If it's uh, in the house, okay. I am a true addict through and through. If it's here, I will eat it. And I am more healthy in body and mind than I ever have been. However, I still have my issues. Uh, I just a few days ago published an article about eating and you know, titled something like meth, Adderall, lipo. And, and it's, you know, it's about the, my eating issues. Because that was a part of what you did as well, is that you had liposuction mm -hmm. a, in an effort to, I guess, control your curves? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, my sister was 21. I was 24. Oh uh, this was many, many years ago before it was even, um, and I think it's in LA anyway, it's, it's pretty common for young girls. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I've heard of graduation gifts being given to oh girls graduating from Beverly Hills High who get lipo and breast enhancement and what have you. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, only in LA. <laughs> and we were delusional. I mean, absolutely in delusional. My sister was in uh, Showgirls, you know, at the time, and we saw a clip on of it recently. And so we see what she looked like. And we have similar body shapes. And uh, and weight and so forth. And that was pre-lipo, like maybe just months before we got it. And uh, we were delusional. It, I don't even know what the doctor did. My stepdad said that when I asked him to do my arms, that he just pretended he did. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't know. It just, it was just, we were, yeah. Now you mentioned showgirls. You were in that, right? You and your sister were in that? I wasn't. I'd visit her on set and so forth. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But she, but she was. And uh, during that whole, uh, she was eating donuts and feeling so much fatter <laughs> than all the other girls. I'd visit her on set. We eat donuts Hello. together. <laughs> I had an acting coach once say that donuts are the only food that repurposes itself on your body the way it looks before you eat it. And, you know, the irony, Hannah, is that everybody wants a booty and boobs and curves now i know right they pay yeah. big bucks for that and here you were at oh, the ripe age of 21 and 24. very I'm, different time very very different time. yeah thank god mm, i thank know god let your curves fly ladies That's... just really embrace the curve and even then i mean we stopped making as much money at once we lost the curves oh that's interesting yeah we, we oh both, wow it, it did not it did not help so the very thing that you were doing to make more money is the very thing that prevented you from making more. Yeah. 
You know, again, I'm in awe of your strength and courage in the midst of everything you went through to keep getting up and showing up and whether initially to get your fix, especially while using, you managed to take a very, you know, some very challenging classes at UCLA, Mm -hmm. maintain a 4.0 GPA and then graduate. And I didn't get a sense you had a faith you relied on early on. In fact, when you first applied and got accepted to college. Wow, you really, was, you really paid attention. <laughs> I really, this one, I just, I mean, it was in the religion department because you thought it would be easier to get in and then you would change majors later. Yes. But on your first day of class, you walked in and then immediately walked out after seeing a sculpture of Jesus hanging on the cross because you wrote that you didn't imagine that majoring in religion meant you had to be religious. No, I really so, didn't. I thought, oh, I'll be studying the religions of the world. I'll be in Montreal. I'll learn French. I had this whole fantasy, you know, and it was nothing and nothing against that religion. It just I didn't realize I had to be religious. But in all fairness, I mean, you didn't really stick around long enough. You you walked out. <laughs> no. But yeah. talk about comic relief. I mean, these are the moments in your book that you will describe something so harrowing. And then you'll just have this kind of throwaway line, such as this one, that you, you know, you didn't imagine that majoring in religion meant you had to be religious, which it doesn't. But your stories are filled with these just gems. And I'm curious if that was intentional or just the irony you noticed throughout Mm. your life. (laughs) Thank you for that observation, Cheryl. It's such a pleasure to to talk with the podcast host who, you know, just the depth that you read it. I did not know. I definitely, I, I, I wrote my experience and it wasn't until I was reading it out loud to my writing group that I would hear the humor back and it always surprised me. To this day, it still does. And, uh, Yeah. You you know, I don't know if you would even fashion this in your mind, but this could totally be a stand up routine. I mean, just taking some of these vignettes. I mean, funny, not funny. I mean, certainly not making fun of your your past. I love love hearing the laughter. And, and, you know, I've spoken on so many different panels uh, with these heavy subjects. And, you know, it's in the truth of it, in the details, there's that the humor because there there is the hu you know it's truth brings that and the identification people have with that <laughs> stand up yeah oh my god and it's you know i i and just yeah i really value that you that you saw that part of it i know some you know you know different people have different experience of reading the book it's all throughout it i mean i've just i've sat here and highlighted so many of your forgive me punchlines but <laughs> Good, I mean, good. seriously, you would say something and then just smack. It's just like, oh, that's hysterical. Does she know this is hysterical? I And and this, I so didn't plan on saying this, but when yeah. you mentioned House of Pies, yeah. I'm like, oh, it, which I, the, the only one I know of that exists is near, I think, Los Feliz. Yeah. The one you described on Santa Monica Boulevard is, was the place that I used to go to when I was a kid. I love that. Oh, oh my Pies. God, you did. <laughs> Yes, uh, that's what I'm saying. Reading your book, I'm like, how so pies? I mean, I love writing about LA. It's just the deep, you know, or any city. It's it's its own character, you know. Those yes, depressing cities in the South, you know, with a Waffle House, and I mean, just the, like <laughs> yeah, where I'm going next month. You know, I'm like, oh my God, it's just going to be a story there. I know it. Well, there is, I lived in the South for two years. And when you mentioned Waffle House, I'm like, oh, good God, this woman even knows the Waffle House. <laughs> yeah. And then speaking about flying cockroaches in Florida. Yes. And, oh, my gosh, such a rich, rich story. And given that I just touched on you not having a religion, et cetera, mm-hmm. at that time, do you have a faith that you rely on now? Definitely. Definitely. And when I look back, I always did. Uh, my father was very much into meditation practice and, and as the back cover says, the communes and yogis. And so was this uh, understanding that for me anyway, that God, uh, whatever word works for somebody, I felt like the universe was one. Like it was kind of like this all, 
all of us make up God. That was, I felt that way from a very, very young age. However, I got disconnected from that and came back to that once I got sober. And that faith has grown. It has grown tremendously. I, I was not, even when I came into the program, I wasn't open to the program because I saw that word God. And um, that just really turned me off until I started to hear, you know, that it's a God of my understanding of, of one's own. And that over this past 14 years has grown and grown. The whole time I was writing the book, it grew. And that's not to say I don't lose faith. I don't uh, lose sight of, of that and that feeling in something bigger than myself. However, at this point in my journey, the evidence weighing to, to how I've been taken care of, provided for the blessings, it would be as if, I always think of this, like it, if, I'm, if I don't take a moment to acknowledge that, then I feel like I'm slapping God in the face because it's like, I've been so blessed going back to the beginning of this podcast. When you said that given the, the damage that I did to myself early on, it's amazing that I'm here today, that I'm talking with you, that I've been able to share my story. And this isn't necessarily part of the book, but because my father is such a, you know, figure in the book and my relationship with him, that, that faith that God grew all the bigger when my father died. You know, I did definitely, as I think I mentioned, read and feel a through line of hope and grace on your life, even in the midst of really horrible, you know, situations and circumstances. Yeah. I really saw that on you and everything you just said, the fact that you're here, you're speaking with me, you wrote this very powerful memoir and you've come through the abyss mm -hmm. to be the woman and the writer that you are right now. And I'm wondering what pearls of wisdom or skills you've learned that might be of help to others that are struggling with addiction and self-value. There is no way I could have done it alone. Community is everything. Whether that community starts with one person, right? Uh, it has been not a solo journey. It's been a program for me of action. I can intellectualize, read uh, all of the therapy that I you know, could do, all of it. However, community and, and taking action, taking contrary action, I did not wanna do any of it, not anything that, that nourished me because it was foreign. Uh, however, I think of my sobriety as working a muscle. Yeah. And the more that I take that contrary action, the contrary action is building the muscle. And so maybe this is getting too, too, a little too ab abstract, but the single most. No, not at all. Not at all. The single most I would, I would say is community and absolutely higher power. But I think for me or not think I know for me that my higher power, God has come through the community. And that extends beyond AA, extends to the writing community, all my different communities, which are very, for me, integrated. This book has been, a, been a, you know, as solitary as, you know, so much of, you know, of course, writing requires solitude. It's also been a community, <laughs> community effort for, you know, all the calls I made during it, losing faith that I could do it and the, you know, tolerating what I was writing and, you know, here talking with other people who, you know, how they continue to sit with themselves as they wrote. And, and really, you know, it's so basic, but one moment at a time. And that serves me very well because beyond sobriety, that one moment of time has applied to everything in my life everything so one part is not disconnected from the other it's all part of it thank you for expounding upon that because yes community is everything and i've said this several times in this podcast if covid taught us nothing it's how much we really need to be in community because yes. isolation is the devil's playground and i yes. will say the devil because it's the thing that keeps us in our 
ruminating over really ugly stuff yeah. keeps us in our addictions, keeps our shame and all the things that we could hide from one another able to flourish as opposed to when you're in community, things come out in the light, both good and bad. So I appreciate you sharing more about that. And I'm curious, what brings you joy? I imagine it's your writing, your community, but what else brings you joy? I love being in nature. It's, it feeds hmm. every part of me. And, uh, and I think that comes from such a young age of, of being in nature. It restores me. It brings me back to what's important. It helps me breathe. It puts things in perspective, connects me to God, connects me to you. However, I do live in the city. <laughs> <laughs> and yet- like I'm looking out the I'm, window now and I'm like, what is a concrete building? <laughs> yeah, but if I can interject in your writing, I'm not surprised by that answer because in your writing, the way you describe sunlight or a flower you saw or the colors you saw of where you were living and you're very observant in your surroundings and you always in the midst of just like I say, I mean, this harrowing addiction, you found ways to notice beauty. So I'm not surprised by that and answer that, at all. You know, and that is one of the many blessings of my upbringing, uh, you know, despite or or on top of the, the harrowing incidents, there was always the draw towards beauty. I mean, my father, it was like, I mean, poetry is, is beauty. Is beauty. Yeah. So it was like, that was part of how I was raised. And uh, yeah, and, and even in the, the concrete city, there, there's much of it. I was uh, yesterday had an experience with a caterpillar. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I just was like, I had the best time just staring at this, you know, crouching down on the pavement, watching this caterpillar. Uh, you know, I think that's also one of the gifts of getting older is I, I, I you know, pay attention to perhaps things that um, there's different weight in it now. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree. At, at the place that I'm, I have a, a freelance temp job I'm working at and I didn't have my glasses on and I'm walking down the hallway and I thought it was someone dropped their pen. And as I went to, down to pick it up, it was a millipede. And they're fascinating. <laughs> they're just yeah, fascinating. So and I love that. Yeah. And I called someone to get it simply because I didn't have a tissue with, and I said, please don't crush it. Don't crush it, please. Yeah. Anything with a thousand legs, which they don't really have a thousand. Yeah, but don't, don't, please just put it outside. So I have a question that I like to ask all of my guests before we say goodbye. And that is if there was a soundtrack to your life, what would be on it and why? However, you have your own playlist for strip. <laughs> you, you really, Cheryl, I'm just, <laughs> you really did the research. I do. I do. It was published by Lighthearted Boy website, which I was completely unfamiliar with them. Yeah. The fact that you broke down your selections in segments to support your chapters from childhood to adult with each chapter having its own musical selection. Can you share what some of those songs are and what music best describe your life now? Yes, I, I <laughs> and you, I mean, I, I did, the, I think I did that over a year ago, so I haven't given it much thought, but it was so much fun to do and so uh, kind of easy. It just came very natural. So I'm like, of course, uh, you know, childhood would definitely, and maybe I didn't put it on the, on, on that soundtrack, but uh, Kirtan, Indian music. Absolutely, because um, it really is just, I find it so comforting and it was played so much in my childhood along with uh, Bob Marley and Bob Dylan. Oh, oh wait, so, so certain songs in particular? Let's see. If you want to, otherwise yeah. that's the soundtrack to your book, which makes sense because it, it is your life and it is the chapters and also the breakdown, which you have in your book from childhood to adult. But it, whether it's particular songs for your book, mm -hmm. or maybe you have a different song and a different soundtrack for the Hana you are now. <laughs> I really, I love music. However, at home, also with writing, I don't, you know, can't write with music. The kirtan has been where I'm at right now, uh, especially since my father died. It, mm -hmm. I just find it so comforting and otherworldly where I'm at now. I, yeah, I mean, that that's 
where I sink in or when I have, you know, with, with my meditation practice, I find, um, you know, tribal, I don't know if it's tribal flute, but uh, Indian flute. Yeah, I guess very drawn to, the, to Indian, Indian music right now. Uh, and at the same time, I, I love listening to rap, <laughs> you know, especially 90s. Very different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Talk I mean, about dichotomies. <laughs> yeah, like yesterday, you know, like, you know, definitely some heavy, you know, some rap songs. Absolutely. Like, so yes, uh, the, the, this, the, the, or even Metallica. I mean, it's, you know, and then, and then, <laughs> and, then uh, and then there's Leonard Cohen. Uh, Leonard Cohen is one of my favorites. However, I find him a little difficult to listen to right now. It just makes me think too much of my father and, uh, and, and too melancholy. And, uh, and Dylan will, Bob Dylan will be forever one of my top, top ones. D- Dylan and, and, um, and Leonard Cohen, yeah. Well, I can see why Leonard Cohen, because your dad, didn't he interview and produce a yeah. A radio feature on Leonard Cohen for CBC. He did. He did. And it was so much fun going, I'm not so much fun, but, uh, you know, when I have since gone through my father's things, coming across pictures like with him, with Leonard, uh, is, has been really such a gift, uh, and getting to go through archives. Yes. Yes, definitely. Hannah, thank you so much for taking this time with me to talk about your memoir. And I want to let listeners know Strip is available at Barnes & Noble via Amazon at your neighborhood bookstore. And if not, please request it. And is there anything else you want to say before we say goodbye? Oh, I just want to thank you so much. And thank you for bringing such a variety of stories forward. Uh, Podcasts are one of my favorite things. And, and, and it's just been such a lovely, lovely uh, rainy Saturday morning with you uh, and with the listeners. Oh, God, there's so much. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, the, the, my book is dedicated to learning to sit in the hours. And for me, that's been the most, one of the most valuable parts of my journey. And, you know, I impart that to others. And hopefully if, if you know, anything in my book, uh, one of the one of the things is doing ex- exactly that because if I haven't if I hadn't and continues to not be that learning of sitting with myself there'd be no sobriety there'd be no book there'd be no talking with you no appreciation of nature uh, it would all be very fleeting and uh, breathless. One moment, one breath, one day at a time. Mm-hmm. So I wish you continued health and sobriety and and thank you so much for sharing your heart and your gift and this time with me. Thank you, Cheryl. You're welcome. I'd also like to thank the following news outlets for the use of their clips in so aptly painting the picture of the fear that we're facing during this pandemic. BBC, PBS, Now This, UNESCO, and Some Good News. I especially want to thank Joel and Luke Smallbone, otherwise known as the group for King and Country, for allowing me to use an excerpt of their song Together, which could not be a more hopeful and inspiring song for such a time as this. Finally, I'll leave you with the following from Proverbs 23, 18. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Thank you again for joining me today. Feel free to offer feedback or a story idea at 19stories at soundsatchelstudios.com via Instagram at Cheryl Holling VO. I look forward to sharing more stories on the next episode of 19 Stories from Fear to Hope. Until then, stay healthy and hopeful. Together with our differences, together we are bolder, braver, stronger.